Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming by. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 368. Today, my guest is Master Joe Corley. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick. We make sparring gear and uniforms and all kinds of stuff. Great sweatshirts, comfy sweatpants, t-shirts, hats. And it's all focused around helping you live the martial arts lifestyle that is important to you. Now, of course, you can save at whistlekick.com by using the code podcast15 and that gets you, you guessed it, 15% off everything over there, even sale price stuff. But you might be more interested in the podcast show notes and the other things we have going on for this show. And those are at a separate site, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Nice and easy. And as always, we don't charge anything for this show. We don't put any of the episodes behind a paywall. But what we do ask is that you help us spread the word. Share this episode or maybe another one of your favorites with your martial arts friends. Help them find the show. Help this show grow so we can attract more and bigger martial arts stories from the people who made the martial arts what it is today and who are helping move it forward for future generations. Now, today's guest kind of fits both of those descriptions. Master Joe Corley not only had a tremendous hand in forming what we know as the martial arts landscape of today, but he's still working to move it forward and to keep it available to those of future generations. We had a wonderful conversation, and here's someone that, man, I I wish I lived closer, because I've got a feeling that this guy would be my guy. The man that I would turn to, my Pat Johnson, perhaps, and that'll make more sense as we get into the episode. So let me step back, and this is my conversation with Master Joe Corley. Master Corley, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Great to be here with you. Oh, it's great to have you here. I've been looking forward to this one for, I don't know, when we set this up, a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, you know, I was, th- just this past weekend, I was in Atlantic City with Sifu Allen Goldberg at his event and a whole yep. bunch of your contemporaries, folks that, that I know you know quite well. Yeah, I wish I could have been there. I, I was had to be in two places this weekend and <laughs> got, smacked work well by, got smacked by a car last Tuesday. Oh, and no. uh, it, 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 it took the precedence over a lot of things that I had planned during the week. And uh, so as it turned out, I couldn't get away to get up there. No. Oh. Well, I wasn't even expecting you there, so that that would have been a, a nice surprise. Yeah, yeah, I, I made it up a couple of years ago, but uh, I've only been one so far. All right, well, maybe next time, hopefully. Yep, yep. Well, you know, we can we could spend our time talking about people that that you know that that I've had the opportunity to talk to, but of course, we're we're really here to talk about you and talk about your martial arts story. So let's let's roll the clock back. How did you first find martial arts? You know, I, I was a military brat. Um, when I was six years old, my dad gave me a pair of boxing gloves and a baseball glove and a baseball. And the two things I always enjoyed most were uh, fighting slash sparring and playing baseball. And in fact, the only time my martial arts training was interrupted was um, when I took a summer off to play baseball when I, when I first graduated from high school. Um, the, um, the, uh, I, I guess the, the short story version is that, um, when my dad taught me to box, you know, basic boxing, you know, jab cross primarily as a kid, we were, he was career army. We would move, uh, from one army base to another one. And he would explain to me that there would be larger kids coming to quotes, invite me to the neighborhood. And uh, that it would be okay if I hit them in the face with a jab and a cross to let them know that uh, that I wouldn't be a victim of bullying. And so my dad passed away when I was 10. Um, and then um, I went back to the military school that he had enrolled me in in the first grade. We had gone away from uh, the States uh, when I was in the second, third, and fourth grade. And when he was diagnosed with lung cancer, he came back to Walter Reed Hospital in D.C., and then I spent the final half of the fourth grade in Tennessee with my grandparents, and then in the fifth grade went back into the military school. And the way I often describe it is half the students at the military school were sent there by parents who couldn't manage them at home, and so they were the unruly ones, if you will. And so 
I think I set a record at the military school for being involved in the most fights, and and I never lost a fight uh, until the 11th grade. Uh, I ended up in a draw with a, a person that uh, was a, a wrestler at the time, and be, that became kind of a metaphor for what would happen with them mixed martial arts versus kickboxing later in life. But the the uh, the long and, and short of it was that when I was 16, I saw a flyer for karate classes. And karate to me at the time meant that I would get to go and break stuff like bricks. And I figured if I could break bricks, I could also break uh, these people that I had seen who were adults who fought a lot more viciously than kids did. and. Uh, so when I uh, signed up for this class at the YMCA uh, here in Atlanta, uh, the first night I just fell in love with it, and I, I felt felt like I had found a home. So that was my my first, you know, having enjoyed the you know the the boxing, although not organized boxing, but learning how to box and learning how to use my hands to protect myself, and then being able to get into an organized fighting game uh, that became a real a, a real draw and a real affinity for me mm. now boxing you know if, if, your, if your father put you in boxing gloves i'm guessing he had some experience with boxing well at my dad's age um there was always a boxing ring in the you know in the gyms and if people were to go back and and to on YouTube search for the Gillette Cavalcade of Sports boxing jingle, they would they would uh, see that boxing was um, basically sponsored in those early days by Gillette. So my dad and I used to watch boxing. You know, um, Gillette Cavalcade was supposed to be Friday night boxing from the garden. And so, in his day, if two kids had a problem with one another, the coach would throw two pairs of gloves in the ring and make the kids go in there and settle their differences. And uh, of course, in today's world, they would send us to safe places so we could, you know, lick our, our, uh, our immortal wounds. Right. <laughs> you and I have had some, uh, had a, had a bit of a pre conversation when we last talked, you know, not, not recorded and, and uh, you know, there, there's some, there's some elements there that, that, I think the listeners might be able to um, read between the lines on things that, that you and I are, are lined up pretty well on. Now, what do you yeah, think, yeah. what do you think your father would have thought about your journey into martial arts, into, into non-boxing martial arts? Well, I think he would have been, uh, I think he would have been very supportive and, uh, and, and very proud, you know, um, I think uh, you know I I can't re I, I can't remember my dad uh, too well, um, but I can I can I remember an anecdote um, when when we were visiting when I was actually living with my mom the summer that he passed away in Washington D.C. He was in Walter Reed and my mom enrolled me in a day camp there, and the first day in that day camp. Um, uh, first thing in the morning, I was out on the playground and there was a kid out there throwing rocks at a squirrel and he was trying to, you know, hurt the squirrel. And I said, you know, leave, leave the squirrel alone. He said, you'll just have to make me. So I hit him with an uppercut in the stomach and he fell on the ground, turned purple. Just then the woman who ran the daycare center came out and said, what's going on here? I said, oh, he was trying to hurt this squirrel. And he told me I'd have to make him stop. So I did. She said, oh, okay and turned around and went back inside. And then in the last part of the day camp that day, there was a, a kid who was going around and pushing everybody, you know, that was in the waiting room waiting for their parents to get there. And so he came and pushed me, and I told him to stop, and he pushed me again, and I used that same uppercut. And about the time his mother walked in and saw him lying on the floor purple, she said, oh, I hope to God my son never does anything like this. And as a 10-year-old, I said, I don't think you'll have to worry about that. And for whatever reason, I just walked out the front door of this daycare center as a 10-year-old, walked down the street, and uh, went to my dad's room at, uh, at Walter Reed Hospital. He said, what are you doing here? And I told him the story. He said, that's, uh, 
that's interesting. Are you hungry? And, and then he gave me his meal. So my dad, I think, would have, would have, you know, been from the uh, old school, what we might in these days call the John Wayne school, and um, would have thought that, you know, if you did something well in the fight world, that that was a thing to be proud of, and it wouldn't fall into the category of toxic masculinity. When we talk about martial arts and, and self-defense, really as broader topics, we're very rarely talking about using our skills to defend others. I mean, that's not a combat scenario that very few schools will address, at least in my experience. But here you've now shared a couple stories where you used some of what your father taught you to protect others. Has that been a theme in your life? Or are we just kind of looking at a couple isolated incidents? Well, uh, in in the real world, I haven't had to, you know, defend men against other people. I have stood in and 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 told people that they should back off as a as a high school senior after I had already done pretty well in my preliminary martial arts training. Uh, I had a friend who wasn't a, a very um, a very robust kind of guy, and the, the high school quarterback. Uh, threatened him in front of me one day, and I, I told him that he shouldn't do that again, or I'd beat the crap out of him. And so he left him alone. So there's some, a few cases like that that happen, but you know, not in the serious world. And in the Krav Maga training that we do now, we do a lot of third party protection. You know, uh, that comes as you know from the Israeli Defense Forces. So you do some third party protection there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was uh, actually both my parents ended up being alcoholics. And so um, I did some therapy for that kind of thing over the years. And, and I pretty much was uh, was evaluated as someone who could be what you would call codependent and would spend time trying to help uh, other people solve problems that they probably should have solved on their own. But on the physical defense side, I didn't have to do a whole lot of defending of other people. Still sounds like it's it's a big part of your character. And I suspect that it, even if it's not the primary reason, I, I would guess if we were to really dig deep, if we were to you know, turn this in some kind of therapy session, that we'd probably find that's a, a strong motivator for you. Yeah, it could be. Um... I, I hate to see the bullying that's going on. You know, uh, like you alluded to a few minutes ago, we we had some uh, short conversations about politics. But I hate to see numbers of people ganging up on other people. Um, you know, weenies gathering up in in big numbers and then bullying people that uh, you know they shouldn't even be allowed to talk to. You know, it's just uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I I, th I think that moves me, and it and it moves a lot of the, you know, uh, I, I really prefer to call it the Clint Eastwood types in in my generation. Mm. Walk softly, talk softly, and carry a big forty four. <laughs> you know, bullying is is such a prominent topic in our world right now, and I don't just mean in the wider world, but I mean in the martial arts world because we as martial artists have an opportunity through not only the physical skill development, but also the, the character development that we're offering, offering up to children in, in the majority, if not all schools. But one of the things that I find interesting about this discussion is that different people draw the line of what is bullying and what is not very differently. Obviously, the world isn't going to bow down and give you everything you want, but at the same time, you should be able to go to school or work without getting punched in the face. Where do you draw that line? Well, you know, I, I would probably fall into the category of, uh, of having a chip on my shoulder and uh, teaching the kids that are in our in uh, under our supervision to, you know, have have that chip. Uh, there, so that uh, if um, if if um, uh, gosh, what's the word? I mean, if, if confronted to you know to act 
sooner rather than later. Uh, we had a young man who came to us, you know, literally in the last three months, and he had three particular kids from the um, football team picking on him. He was a middle schooler, and he wasn't as big as they were, and and uh, but he's a great swimmer. I mean, he's a kid that you know can put in thousands and thousands of yards in a workout. He swims more in a day than I've swum in my whole life. And uh, so he's a tough kid. And when you talk to him, you know, he's got great eye contact. And, you know, just the thought of him having to endure it even one more day uh, just uh, <clears throat> didn't sit well. So we showed him some, you know, we were doing Krav Maga private training with him. And so, you know, the next day the the kid reached out for him and got smacked. and. Uh, that started the beginning of the end. So um, I, I don't, um, I mean, uh, you know, I, I believe that Jesus, you know, uh, had the ability to turn the other cheek. And um, I don't believe in the culture that we live in that turning the other cheek gains much for you. So uh, what I used to call it and still prefer to call what we do is, is we call it the Clint Eastwood assertiveness program. And, uh, you know, so you, you can talk softly and you can be polite, but it should be very clear to the other person that you will put up with none of their crap. Not a little bit, but none. I'm right there with you, as you might have suspected. Yeah. But, uh, there there are there are quite a few days and exchanges that I wish I could go back and live over knowing what yeah. I know now. Sure, sure. Every kid that was ever bullied wants that. And then you have a society that wants to, you know, basically uh, erase that from our from our, our masculine code. You know, I mean, it's been going on for, you know, some five decades. And so you can't change society. Like you say, you can't force society to bow down to what your wants and needs are. But when you see these kids come in, one of the things I always ask in each one of our introductory lessons to the parents is, uh, Mr. Smith, will, will you, let's say Jimmy has to defend himself in school where they have a zero tolerance rule, will you actually stand up for him uh, if he gets in trouble at school protecting himself? And uh, I had 100% of the parents say, yes, of course. And uh, in Georgia, um, Last year, as a matter of fact, I believe it was in 2018, a three-year-old case was finally decided by the Georgia Supreme Court that said that this girl who had been suspended from her school three years earlier for defending herself and hurting the child that tried to, the high school kid that tried to attack her, she got suspended, went and graduated from another school. Now she was all, already in college, but they said that her right to protect herself superseded the school's stupid zero tolerance rule. They didn't say stupid, that's inserted by me, but that's nice to know. And so I always remind the parents of that, that their kids have every right to protect themselves. Completely agree. Well, let's switch gears a little bit, because I know a lot of folks who are listening know you because of your time in competition. So I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to veer off into that world a little bit. Why don't you tell us how, how competition even came on your radar? Well, again, I think because of my attraction to the, you know, the, the, not the competitive side of boxing, but the, you know, the interaction, the one-on-one. -on -one. When I played baseball, I was a pitcher, and I liked that one-on-one -on -one drama as well. That, um, First tournament I had a chance to go to was I was I was a green belt and um, uh, I mean it it yeah, really excited me really uh, my fire and um, so and I, I seemed to be a pretty good fighter for time and so I entered a lot of tournaments George and the Alabama Brown Belt Championship and then when I got to uh, First degree black belt, I won a Southeast Black Belt Championship, and then I won a couple of what were called U.S. titles at the time and fought some pretty good people and, and beat some pretty good people. Then I got ranked among the top 10 in the United States for quite a while. And then, uh, um, you know, traveled the country, 
primarily in the beginning, it was the Korean circuit. So um, then at, at the third degree black belt level, uh, when I started training with Chuck Norris and Pat Johnson, we started going to more of the open tournaments around the country. And, um, you know, starting in 1972 and sadly in 1973, I had a back injury that just wouldn't let go. So I really only got to do the, the open tournament circuit, you know, for, you know, about a year and a half. And then my back pain got to be so intense that I couldn't, I couldn't continue. But uh, I really enjoyed the, the one-on-one uh, drama of, of that fighting. It's like the whole world would come down to, you know, that, you know, if the ring sizes were correct, 400 square feet. And, uh, you know, the intensity was just so good there. So it's, when we when we do our um, pledge at the beginning and end of our class, we call them our intensity pledges. And that's been one of the fundamental things that I have felt that we could do most for kids is helping them develop a sense of intensity while uh, Stephen Jobs' work takes them, you know, in the complete other direction from intensity unless it involves playing a game, you know, on their devices, that kids really lack that ability to focus and jump into gear, you know, unless they're competitive, you know, varsity athletes. And I think that comes down to maybe 2% of the student body. Mm. Yeah, there, there's a whole lot there that, you know, I think when we look back at the early days of martial arts, martial arts made a great option. But I think as we move forward, the things that those of us who have been training for a long time sometimes take for granted as being so instilled in martial arts culture and martial arts instruction culture seem like they're becoming more and more necessary, more and more lost. And I think that could be an opportunity. And, and you, if I am correct, sir, you, you have schools? Is this something that you discuss with your instructors and are, are watching for, for that opportunity? Well, it, it kind of begs kind of a broader answer. Um, you know, we have for, uh, you know, a couple of decades now been telling the public about all these wonderful life skills that we teach people in the martial arts schools. And um, uh, I would venture to guess that, <clears throat> sadly, if, if, um, these martial arts instructors were doctors and you went and you watched how those doctors lived, you might not want to hire those doctors. In other words, I've seen schools where the instructors can't find their own asses with both hands, yet they're teaching the kids all these, all these things, these rules for life. So in uh, 1994, which, uh, gosh, I said it's a quarter century ago now, I was first introduced to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Sure. And at the time, we had eight studios. And so I began training all of our instructors in the seven habits so that they could learn from the inside out what the, you know, the most effective principles would be for them to live not in their lives, but be able to share with their students. And it would, some of them, it would be, for some of them, it would be, um, you know, 15 years or 20 years later when they would come to me and say, man, we really got so much from that. And we didn't even know it at the time, which means that, you know, so many of our students are not even teachable. So I think when you teach people a bunch of platitudes and they can just recite them back to you from memory, but they don't really get a chance to learn the lessons that you know, that um, that it, it's very difficult to impart those things. So um, I think now, uh, having looked back on all of it, that the, the thing to do is to uh, teach people the thing that they think they want to learn, uh, you know, give them the platitudes if that makes you feel better, and then try to figure out where the student is actually teachable to learn those things and then teach them to those students if you know those things yourself. But as Covey would say, you have to start from the inside out and you have to look at yourself and you have to say, do I really know what I'm talking about or am I just pretending to know what I'm talking about? And so uh, if the martial arts had in it what I once believed it had in it, 
which was that whole Zen concept of mindfulness training, if that was really there in the martial arts, then it would seem that um, the person teaching it couldn't eliminate it. But obviously the person teaching it can eliminate it, just like the people who are making laws, you know, might break all the laws that, that they're enforcing on other people. So uh, that probably wasn't the question you asked, but uh, that's kind of an overview about how I feel about what's happening, and things that we're teaching, why we're teaching them, and what the real net effect of it is. And that's okay. There are no wrong answers to any of the questions that I ask. And, right. and of course, you've taken us in a, in a slightly different direction. Now, you brought up this idea that a lot of martial arts instructors are not people that we should be looking up to. Now, now first, of course, everyone's human, regardless of rank and, and time in and, and what they're teaching and, and all of that. You know, we're all fallible. But you do bring up an important point that sometimes we have these instructors that we are trusting to impart skills, whether they be character skills or physical skills, that they've not attained themselves. And it does create a bit of a paradox. So how do you see that? How do we resolve that? I think uh, we have to turn that over to God because I don't believe we can do that. Uh, we can we can do value judgments, and, and I'm not saying that the people who have earned this rank shouldn't get the same respect that they would have if they were a first lieutenant or a captain or a major or a colonel or a general in the service. What I'm saying is that some of them believe that just because they've received that rank that they have these skills that they really have not yet uh, acquired, that they haven't yet perfected. So. Uh, so when I say platitudes, I mean they're they're actually passing on words and phrases, but they're not really digging in and and teaching the people how to use those things, and that becomes more and more difficult in our entire culture. So I'm not really faulting them for doing it, but I just I just say we we can't expect that they're getting it done at the rate that we we like we. We're going to affect, you know, maybe 2% of our student body, you know how, no matter what we're doing. But I, I wish we could affect the whole 100%. So um, I, I don't really think that there's a way to resolve it. Uh, you know, just uh, I guess we live in a great country where, you know, the, the wheat will at some point be separated from the chaff. I hope so. I, I... No matter how I slice it, you know, when I look into the future, I think that that, that has to happen. I think that's the only outcome. Yeah, if, uh, if God is truly on, on our country's side, that will happen. As we look back over your long martial arts career, I mean, you've been, you've been at this for a while. You've trained with and competed with and, and met so many amazing people, quite a few that we've had on the show already. And I know that you've got a lot of stories from that time. So if you were to dig into the archives, if you were writing your autobiography and you wanted to put one story front and center to really hook the reader, your, your best or your favorite martial arts story, what would that story be? You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, Obviously, a deep question, and and it can happen on a lot of levels. Since I've since I've actually been involved in so many different parts of the martial arts, um, uh, <clears throat> I, I guess on the physical side, I, I would put it like this because it also ties in with uh, with with what uh, has happened on the, my mental side of the martial arts development. But uh, when I first decided that. I wanted to, yeah, yeah, that, that'd be, uh, and, and I know how to zone in on that answer. Um, I was, uh, I was in a 600 square foot karate school that I owned with a partner, and I was watching this old Super 8 millimeter film. It wasn't old at the time, but it was uh, Joe Lewis and Chuck Norris and Alan Steen fighting among each other 
for the Grand Championship of the Internationals Championship, and I wore that that video out. Oh, and that video is tape, eight millimeter film at the time. Wore it out watching them, and so I decided to branch out of the Southeast. Like I said earlier, I'd won the Southeast Black Belt Championship, and so I wanted to do some national competition. So I went to New York City. Uh, and fought in a tournament there at Madison Square Garden, which was a Henry Cho's tournament. And uh, in that day, I beat a guy named uh, Hawk Frazier. And then there was some talk going on. I was nobody there representing me. Some talk went on. We went back and we re fought the match. And then and he won the match. And then that night, he fought Chuck Norris for the Grand Championship. And... Uh, so I got a chance to meet Chuck there, and Chuck invited me to come out to Los Angeles to train with him sometime when I would be in the area. So it would be uh, four years after that when I would finally get out there and train with him. And when I got there, he had already continued his, or had already begun his his uh, movie career. Steve McQueen had gotten Chuck involved in, uh, in uh, the acting classes and then felt it would be great, you know, when... Um, as time went on that he could become a, a good American hero. And so Chuck was busy and he handed me off to Pat Johnson, who was his chief instructor. And uh, Pat became my mentor for life and my mentor for the um, martial arts at the time. We had both, all of us had started in Tang Soo Do. And then, um, so I learned a lot about hands and sweeps and all that from Pat Johnson and you know, had the pleasure of, of most of the Norris team, you know, you know, knocking the breath out of me and doing wonderful things with their hands that we that we weren't able to do. So I made good friendships with people like uh, John Natividad, those kind of people who just recently was at our Battle of Atlanta 50 and um, was one of the recipients of the Joe Lewis Eternal Warrior Award. But anyway, I came back to the Southeast and we... Uh, we started the Southeast Karate Association, and then out of that SEKA, we we grew a number of people. And then it would be years later that I would, um, uh, oh, uh, along the way, uh, not so many years later, but the next year, 1973, we we took the Battle of Atlanta to a new level, and we and it went to that new level because of a Pat Johnson suggestion, which was to create a tournament of champions so that the top fighters in the country would be would be given uh, you know 12 seated positions and then four people from the daytime would fill out the other four so you'd have 16 people in the tournament of champions and uh, that was in the height of the kung fu series on television we advertised on on the kung fu series and all and when we went in the back after the eliminations to have our meeting we came out Georgia Tech Coliseum was filled with 8,500 people were sitting in there watching this event. And it was truly a, an exciting event that had uh, Mike Warren in it and Jeff Smith and Bill Wallace and all that. And so Jeff Smith and Howard Jackson fought for the grand championship. The officials at that event were uh, Pat Johnson, Chuck Norris, Mike Stone, uh, Tadashi Yamashita, and Bob Walls. We had five really you know, good referees um, and judges, you know, in the center. So it was really a great event. I had a, I had bought a, a, a 1967 Ferrari GTB4, and I had sold it for $9,000 in order to, to actually uh, fund that event. And now I can buy it back for three and a half million. So it's on my bucket list. Um, <laughs> But um, the the event w the event went well, and then Pat Johnson really became you know my my mentor for life. Like uh, he's not old enough to be my dad, but he felt like a dad to me. So he's I, I guess more like a big brother than anything. But anyway, through th through that, we ended up um, going and making some presentations um, a few years later uh, over at. Um, uh, Turner Network, um, and uh, so this is where the martial arts part of it uh, carries over to the to the second phase of my professional career, if you will. And so uh, there was a, a man named Sid Pike who worked for 
Ted Turner, and he was like a no guy. So any any time you would want to come and talk to Ted, you had to talk to Sid, and Sid's response would always be no. But he was empowered to say no to everything. So about the third time I had met with him, I was there. At, he was the kind of guy that you'd make your presentation to, and he would be looking at you the whole time, but he would never nod his head or or, or make any body movements that would let you know that that you were saying something that he heard. And at the end, when you were asked, so can we do this? He'd say no, and you'd pack your stuff up and leave. So uh, the third time that happened, I was packing my stuff up to leave, and Ted Turner was, some for some reason, in the hallway at the office. This is before it became, you know, a, a, uh, you know, before it became WTBS and all that. And he had just launched the station to a, like a, something like 800,000 people in the United States. And Rob Reiner um, was, uh, no, Carl Reiner, I guess Rob Reiner's dad. Carl Reiner brought a suit against against Turner to stop him from building out this super station. So well, for whatever reason, he's walking around in the halls and he's got this sword and he's swinging the sword. And I would later learn that he had gone to the same military school that I had. He was older than I was, and but he had only made it for a year. But he had this sword from there, and he was swinging it around. He said, ah, karate guy, what would you do against this sword? And I said, well, if you knew what you were doing with it, I would probably leave now, but I think I'll just beat you to death. So I started backing him down the hall, and he's swinging the sword at me, and he, he stops and says, hey, man, I have an idea. So he called in all of his executives. He said, you know, uh, Next week in Washington, uh, Carl Reiner uh, and we were in front of it. We have a uh, an open committee there. Will you come up and speak on behalf of Superstation? And I said, Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And he looked at me and then said, What, what can I do for you? And I said, Well, we've got uh, Jerry Rome is going to be fighting Ross Scott for the World Heavyweight Champion down at Atlanta's Omni, and we'd like to carry it on your Superstation. He said, We'll do that. Said Pikes to him. Said, Yeah, but he said, No, Sid, we'll do it. So anyway, we did that event, and at the end of the event, we had this phenomenal fight. If any of your listeners haven't had a chance to see it, they can see the Jerry Rome versus Ross Scott heavyweight championship from 1977. Compare that with the quality of the fights that you see these days and see what was going on back then. So I went to CBS and just knocked on the door there and said, I'd like to sell you guys this fight. And they said, well, you know, honestly, son, we don't buy fights, you know, that have appeared on other people's networks, but you seem like somebody who can really present this sport well. Let's say that you do the commentary for us on our upcoming PKA bout in Las Vegas next month. I said, oh, the PKA guys really aren't happy with me now. And he said, well, if they don't agree, then we just won't do the fight. And you know, of course, you fought Bill Wallace yourself. So, I mean, who would be better at it? So that started my uh, PKA career, all because of, of, of Ted Turner swinging the thing around. And that all came from, you know, Pat Johnson leading me to believe that that we didn't have to rely on a Korean instructor or an instructor of any type to be who we wanted to be. We didn't have to kind of give up our ourselves to that instructor so that's where our american karate philosophy was born uh was from that so anyway kind of a a long-winded winding story but it uh, it takes you from you know from the fighting to you know to the fighting among the broadcasters which of course was the beginning of the whole whole other chapter of life sure you know and i love those those winding stories as you call them because we touch on so many things. I mean, just the names alone that you had to mention to tell that story. I mean, it's, I'm sure we could turn that story into a movie in and of itself. There's so much, there's so much substance. Yeah. I I, I think it's going to be a a movie at some point in time. Once uh, people care about the PKA the way they once did, then uh, we, uh, we hope to do exactly that. Well, I, I hope that happens soon because I would be there front row opening day. <laughs> Great. I appreciate that. I, uh, I, uh, the other thing that came out of that whole Pat Johnson thing is uh, uh, 
uh, I started writing a book in 1999, and then by the year 2011, I had written three paragraphs, so it wasn't going very fast. And uh, Joe Lewis came into Washington D.C. to to uh, Jeff uh, Jeff Smith had invited us in for June Ree's 80th birthday, and it was held in the rotunda at the at the Senate. And uh, so all the senators spoke about June Ree and all that. Meantime, Joe Lewis is sitting over on the side using his uh, hand strengthening thing that he would always have everybody squeeze. And uh, at the end of the evening, we all went out. So sitting at the table were Alan Steen and Skipper Mullins and Jeff Smith and, you know, all the guys from Texas. And and then uh, Joe Lewis was, uh, he was holding court that night and he had these huge knuckles, you know, on his, on his right hand. and 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 his hands were moving through the air, kind of like a maestro. You know, it's like a, later I would I would teach the the head of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, a man named Joel Levy. And watching Lewis's hands go through the air that night reminded me of Joel Levy, you know, conducting the orchestra. And Lewis stopped and looked at me in the middle of it, and he said, "Quilly, you know how bad I screwed up." I said, "Yes, sir, I I do." And then he went back to talking about whatever he was talking about. And he looked at me a few seconds later and he said, Quilly, I thought you never, uh, never thought you really liked me. I said, yep, I liked you a lot. And uh, the next day I wrote 10 chapters of the book. It just, it just broke it loose. But anyway, the, the point I was going to make is in the book, it, it's done kind of like Kwai Chang Kane, you know, in the Old West and Master Poe. So at the beginning of each chapter, I asked Master Jay, who is Pat Johnson, I asked Master Jay a question. And then he answers it. And then the chapter, it's a short chapter, kind of like John Maxwell's leadership books are, you know, short chapters, little vignettes. And uh, so uh, we look forward to making that into a movie once we uh, get all this stuff done right. and People care again. Yeah. You know, I, I think there is a pretty strong core of people who care. I just don't know that they feel supported in caring about it in that way. You know, the martial arts has changed, the world has changed, and it's it's my own resistance to that change that led to this show. It's the stories that you're telling that so many others have told on this show that I saw starting to slip as I realized that this this amazing generation of martial artists, the folks such as yourself who we you know, I'm 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 39. I'm turning 40 shortly. I owe everything of my martial arts upbringing to folks of your generation. If it hadn't come back from overseas, if it hadn't been something that folks like you and Bill Wallace and, and Joe Lewis had done and brought back and shared, where would it be? It wouldn't be anything close to what it is. And I think it's important that those of us who are a bit younger recognize that and hold on to those stories because I think the stories are just as much a part of our martial arts culture as the movements and the forms and the self-defense techniques. I don't think you can separate the two effectively. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting... Um interesting perspective it's um uh, i remember reading about a baseball pitcher once who won the cy young award but he didn't know who cy young was so it made me realize that it's not you know it's it's not just the martial arts it's the world it's the it's the generations you know and and uh so um i did a post the other day i said um uh reviewing and enjoying the past in order to you know, really appreciate the present and look forward to a better future. So that's the that's the way to make it work. And as you know, it's going to be the way these stories are presented that will make them interesting to a, a crowd that's grown up with um, a miniature computer in their hands that really has an answer to any question that they want, want to ask, but they just don't know what questions to ask because they've lost their curiosity. Now, as we've been talking today, you've named off so many names. 
but I'm curious if there's someone that you didn't have the opportunity to to train with or work by side by side with that maybe you wanted to. Hmm. Well, um, I had a chance to do a 30 minute TV show with uh, Bruce Lee one day when he was promoting his first movie with um, James Garner. And, um, you know, I, I had known, you know, people that had trained with Bruce Lee and all that. So I wasn't one of the people that, you know, thought of Bruce Lee um, in the ways that he was presented. Uh, I felt like he was really a, a great symbol for the martial arts. And at uh, June Rees, uh memorial service in D.C. this past year, I had a good chance to spend some time with his his um, his bride, you know, Linda Lee again. Um, and uh, I guess I guess the, the the people that that I actually respected the most, you know, and that really turned out to be, you know, Jeff Smith and, and Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis, I had a chance to interact with in, in many ways, my judo instructor, Bob Bird, Bird, who is a world masters judo champion. I had a chance to train with him. And, um, and now in the Krav Maga, you know, I'm working with, uh, Bill Clark's group, um, and warrior Krav Maga. So I'm, so I, I guess that's really one of those uh, one of those things where I don't feel wanting. I don't feel like there was someone I would would have wanted to have trained with that I admired that I, I didn't get a chance to. Um, we're working now in the Warrior Krav Maga with a man named Andy Norman who has Defense Lab, and Andy Norman trained Liam Neeson for Taken, and he trained uh, Tom Cruise for the Jack Reacher film, and all that. So. That's all really kind of neat new stuff that we're learning now. Uh, but I, nobody that I really, you know, to answer your question could say, gosh, I wish I'd had a chance to train with that person. Mm -hmm. Now, in the boxing world, in the boxing mm -hmm. world, if I could, if I could get inside the head and copy and paste in the mind, just do a control C in his head, and control V into my head, it would be um, uh, Lomachenko, you know, Vasily Lomachenko best boxer in the history of the world in my opinion now, now boxing just like karate or taekwondo people get really deep into their 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 opinions of who's the best at at certain things or overall why is he your pick for best boxer well when we went to see a pacquiao fight i guess it was with pacquiao when he fought um uh at Mayweather, um, he was an undercard on that fight. We were sitting in a sports club, and I, I was cutting on a steak and watching him. and And I ended up putting the knife down and the fork down and watched him. And two rounds later, I proclaimed to everyone at the table, "This is the best fighter right here of all time." And uh, he said, "Well, how could you know that after two rounds?" I said, "Well, I've just seen in two rounds him do every single thing." that I've ever tried to learn, that I've ever tried to teach, that I've seen anyone else try to teach, I've seen anyone else try to learn, and I've seen him do it against a fighter who's got 50 knockouts. And um, so a couple of years later, the guys on HBO and, uh, and ESPN are saying, yeah, he may be one of the greatest of all times. And now they're saying, yeah, he's really one of the greatest of all times. And then they interviewed him one night, and one of the guys from uh, HBO said, so uh, the consensus is that uh, you're going to have to fight some, some bigger names before you're going to really fall into that category of the, some of the best of all time. And, and Lomachenko said, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And so he had the humility, you know, to go with all of it, too. And uh, uh, But... If you've ever, if you watch, uh, he's got a, a video online called uh, Lomachenko Tricks, and then another one, Lomachenko Headlight uh, Highlights. And of course, all of his videos now have hundreds of thousands of views because people have watched them. They even have gyms in New York that are 
basing their whole entire training patterns on the exercises that he does, which are just different from anybody else. But he can do everything. He can do every single thing. Mm. Wow. Now, this is a good point to mention everyone that, you know, maybe you're new to the show. Maybe this is the first one you've listened to. But, you know, I keep good notes while I'm talking to the guests and we post those notes with links and such over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so people can check that out. Now, you have a favorite boxer. How about a favorite contemporary martial artist? I mean, is there there's somebody that's on the competition circuit now that you look at and say, you know, I would have liked to have gone up against that person back in back in your heyday? I think uh, I think a better question would be I certainly am glad I didn't have to go up against that person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the, the, the top guys of all time, you know, that that I could mention to you that I just have thought had been great stars would include the current ones. And that is. Um, Stephen Thompson, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, you know, who came from kickboxing over to, you know, the UFC. And um, and there's uh, a few others in the in the UFC that, you know, through their styles are are pretty deadly. You know, John Jones was like he was just, uh, you know, just unique enough and and unorthodox enough to make it really hard for everybody had a lot of natural gifts. But He's not a Lomachenko style. He's just very effective in that kind of fighting. But in our PKA world, you had, of course, Joe Lewis, Jeff Smith, Bill Wallace. And then we ended up with Joni Terrio, the Iceman. We ended up with Rick Rufus, Bad Brad Heffin, Jerry Rome, Jerry Trumbull. And, you know, the list just goes on and on. And all of these guys were just super, super good. We're working on a video project now that will have a hundred a hundred hours of our greatest fights of all time. And I've been looking at those videos lately and just marveling at what their fighting skills were in the seventies, eighties, and early nineties. And still they're just head and shoulders above these other people at 25 years later. High praise for sure. Yeah. (laughs) When you think about you, as a martial artist, and, and, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When you think about who you are as a martial artist today, who would you attribute most of that to? Who's been the most influential for you? Is that Pat Johnson or is that somebody else? Yep. It's uh, Pat Johnson, uh, no question. Uh, no question. Um, on, the, uh, on the other parts of, of what uh, I have learned and what I, I think... Uh, have attributed to whatever level of confidence I have right now. I think uh, Jeff Smith and Bill Clark um, would be people who who very much uh, influenced me. Um, you know, the, there's the martial arts side of you that was a fighter, and there and then there's a side that was a teacher, and then there's a side that is the you know philosopher, if you will. And so Pat Johnson probably helped me the most in all three of those areas, and then the the other people um, like uh, Jeff Smith and, and Bill Clark and others whose names people wouldn't necessarily know who helped influence me in, the, in if you will, whatever wisdom that I have been able to acquire. And even though I never met him, uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People influenced my way of thinking and doing and being more than anything else I've, I've ever read. And uh, then his his son's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, and then his son's other book, The Seven Habits of Happy Kids, are are things that just give us a way of, of putting everything into the, the proper uh, perspective. Uh, you know, martial arts is great, but it, it's not your life. I mean, it, it's your lifestyle, if you will, but then your life is got to be made of certain principles and habit seven, you know, is, is called sharpening the saw and the martial arts part of our world is that part of your life where you develop yourself spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally, emotionally. And that's the sharpen the saw part. So uh, that's where Pat Johnson, Jeff Smith, and Bill Wallace have helped me sharpen. Hmm. 
Mm. Very well said. Now, of course, you're still at it. You're still quite involved in, in the martial arts and a lot of what's going on. And the question I always ask people is, is why? You know, what is it that's keeping you motivated, and fired up, and, and whatever, whatever you would choose to describe this, this passion that you clearly still have? Are there things you haven't accomplished yet, or, or is, it a, is it a duty? What is it? Uh, you know, I ask myself that question every Sunday night when I review my mission statement. And, um, and in the mission statement, um, uh, I, I think I get down to the place where I, I'm not happy with the results uh, as of yet. And some people describe it always as pushing the goal line further off. And, um, you know, so you have friends around you and you say, well, I haven't accomplished the things I set out to do. And then they say, no, well, just think about it. you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. But still that, that doesn't, um, you know, reach the level of fulfillment. One of the things that I, I do on many days is I go through uh, Tony Robbins uh, ritual. He calls it his morning ritual. And in that ritual, you actually reflect back on three things that happened, like the, the Ted Turner story that I, that I shared with you. Three things that happened that might have been coincidences, but that you look back on that made such a difference in your life. And then he has you look forward to three things that you want to have happen in your life, that you want to see happen. And, and uh, the one that's most moving there, of course, is that my daughter, who's now 21, would be 30 at that time and she would just give me a big hug and say dad i finally get it and then i see myself in a skybox at madison square garden looking down on a filled arena with celebrities and so on and i have the, the president of either espn or nbc or cbs or showtime or whoever standing next to me and said you know even though it was Dana White and the Fertitta brothers that carried this ball across the goal line. You told us that this was going to be like this for those many decades, and therefore uh, you have finally succeeded with that. And um, and, and then um, the third one would would have to do with the you know the development of the the martial arts um, on a on a global basis um, being being what is always, uh, uh, what's the right way to say it, purported to be, you know, where where the people would come together and draw from this huge base of knowledge where we could figure out what we all have in common and then figure a way to duplicate it like Stephen Covey did with the seven habits. So you could, you could boil it down and say, this is the way we need to teach each and every person. Much, much in the way great pastors would be able to do if they were able to impart to you that which they wanted you to learn so that you would go and do it. I like it. And I agree. If people want to get a hold of you or find what you have going on online, maybe you've got a website for the school or social media you're willing to share, how would people find you? Best way right now is we, we just, the uh, first of January, kicked off the PKA Associated Schools and Member Program, and that's what it's called on Facebook, PKA Associated Schools and Members. And uh, Don Willis and I have kicked this off, and we're we're trying to uh, use this kind of as that maybe that global marketplace, ultimately, that could be a, uh, a space where where people could ultimately go once we have the resources to put the information in. And um, that would be the best way to reach me. My, my email, direct email address is pkajoecorley at gmail.com. So people can write me directly there. Okay, great. Great. And one more thing, if I can trouble you, what parting words, what advice would you tie up this episode? with for the folks listening? You know, that, um, that is uh, 
challenging my my pay grade basically um i i would say that if you could reach out to people like you know from a business perspective if you could reach out to people like bill clark and jeff smith and stephen oliver uh for people who are doing what stephen covey says is doing the right things for the right reasons and with the right principles that that would be a, a great way to tie everything that's a part of a martial arts life together and so i think finding the right mentor for want of a better word um, i don't like the use of guru and professor and all that but if you could find the right mentor slash teacher uh, that people like that would be the great ones to do it if if you can locate that Pat Johnson in your life who's got the the wisdom, the the insights, you know, the the caring, the nurturing qualities that you're looking for, um, would be great to to continually read, you know, and, and try to understand. And and I failed to mention the one who most recently has had the greatest impact on me, and that's uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson who's written the 12 rules for life. And he is today the world's most, um, in my opinion, the most poignant speaker who, who who minces no words, but I would definitely recommend the 12 rules for life as a, as a must read all, almost immediately. And um, to follow his videos online, I think he's had about a billion views so far. And through that, will probably help people find this right mentor that I'm talking about that uh, that they can relate to people that really have not only done it themselves, but can give you the step-by-step -step processes through which to be successful so that you don't waste a lot of your life, you know, following false prophets and, you know, going down rabbit holes that don't lead anywhere. The martial arts, obviously, isn't just about kicking and punching. It's about becoming a better person. It's about finding your place in the world and carving out that niche the best way you can. Now, I have no doubt that all of our guests have done just that through their time training. But I have to say that today's guest was much clearer, much more open about it. And I think we can all connect the dots between martial arts and his life in a stronger way than we can for just about any other guest. So I want to thank you for your time today, sir. Really appreciate the conversation that we had. If you want to check out the show notes, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Don't forget, whistlekick.com for all of your martial arts product needs. Save 15% on everything with the code PODCAST15. Foam gear and Olympic-style Taekwondo gear and semi-contact gloves, and uniforms. There's a lot. There's a lot there, and we're rolling out more all the time. You can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support. It means the world to me. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.